Hi guys, Amelia again. Um, I've had one more question, um, this time from a different student asking me to go over uh, bonding and in particular metallic, ionic and covalent bonding. So um, where do I start? All right, well, um, metallic bonding, essentially we're looking at uh, bonding only within metals. So if you think about your periodic table, um, on the far left we've got um, our metals and then on our far right we've got our non-metals and in the middle we've got a few metalloids. So metallic bonding essentially, um, if you, if you want to think about the model of how me metallic bonding works, um, the, word, the wording that you want to use is, it's going to be um, sorry, I'm just making sure I can get this on here, all on here. So it's going to be um, cations in a sea of electrons. That's kind of the terminology that, ter uh, that teachers want to hear. So uh, what I mean by that, if you can imagine that we've got uh, all these tiny little spheres, which are our metals. Okay, and what they do is they give up their electrons uh, around them. So what happens is that um, if we've got metals, consider what how metals are. They actually um, they uh, want to give away that they've got often got um, low amounts of electrons in their outer shell. They want to satisfy the uh the octet rule by getting rid of some of its electrons in the, in its outer shell so what they do is they essentially allow those electrons to what's called delocalize so if i wanted to add that cations in a sea of delocalized electrons is probably even a better description of that and so what happens is those electrons are in and around all of our cations just like this Okay, and so quite often um, in SACs or exams, the type of question that is asked about this is how do you, you know, describe the, the uh, bonding um, theory of metals and then use that to explain the properties of metals. So, um, what, you know, when you think about metals, um, like I like to use the analogy of um um, so if you're um, uh, cooking a meal, okay, one of the properties of metals is that it conducts heat. So um, if you think about when you're stirring your porridge or whatever you happen to cook, um, you're stirring the, the pot and then you put, put the spoon down in, in the actual pot and walk away and then you come back and if you try to pick it up, you've got to be careful because it could be hot and that's because metals conduct heat. So the reason why metals conduct heat is because of our electrons, okay? They are free to move around. And what that means is that they can pick up the heat or the heat energy from the metal at the bottom of the spoon and actually transfer that up to the top of the spoon. Um, probably even a better analogy of that is if you're talking about um, the conductivity of, of um, metals. So we, we all know, or hopefully we all know by now that, um, you know, the, the um, we have copper wiring, not always copper wiring, but we have metallic wiring that we get all of our electricity to our houses through. If you take your iPhone cord or your laptop cord and you actually cut it in half, please don't do that. Um, but if you did that, it would be a metal inside. And so the reason why um, metals can conduct electricity is because of those delocalized electrons. They can move and carry charge. What else? Um, we've got the malleability and ductility of metal. So um, malleability is essentially your ability to um, um, change the shape of a metal. So that's again got to do with those delocalized electrons. We can move 
these cations around each other and what happens is the electrons follow and are able to um, um, reshape that metal. Ductility is the ability to um, draw that metal into a long string. So uh, same sort of thing as you move the cations, the electrons move with it. So that's just a couple of examples of um, metallic bonding. I'm going to move on to, so this is our metallic bonding here. I'm going to move on to uh, ionic bonding. So within ionic bonding, um, what we have going on is um, we have metals and non-metals. So in metallic bonding, bonding, we've got metals only. Okay. In ionic uh, bonding, we have um, metals and non-metals. And so like what I was talking about with metallic bonding, metals want to give away their electrons and uh, non-metals want to do the exact opposite. They want electrons to complete their outer shell. So um, uh, essentially what happens is that the electrons get transferred from the cations to the, or so, sorry, from the metal to the non-metal. And so the, the metals become positively charged and the non-metals become negatively charged. And if you want to see how that works, go and have a look at your textbook. There's things called electron transfer diagrams. So that, that will explain to you how that works. But essentially what we end up with with our structure for our ionic compounds is um, we end up with alternating positive and negative ions. So... Um, quickly draw up a few lines of this okay so you can see here that we've got alternating positive negative positive negative under our negative one we've got a positive one and then positive negative positive negative now they are held together by what's called electrostatic charges so the same not the same kind of um, forces but like similar to uh, the idea of a north and a south magnet, a uh, pole and a magnet. The north and the south are actually attracted to each other and they want to be um, pulled together. Your north and north want to repel each other and same with your south and south. So the same sort of thing happens with your positives and your negatives. Your positive and your negatives want to be drawn to each other, but if you've got a negative and a negative next to each other, they want to repel. So this is our ionic ionic compound um, or ionic bonding model if you like so it's between metals and non-metals okay um, so then um, when we start to uh, refer that on to how does that explain our properties of ionic compounds so ionic compounds are usually quite strong but brittle. Now the reason they're quite brittle is because if you um, think about, I'm going to take this bottom row here and I'm going to shift it across this way. So I'm going to go this way. So what ends up happening, I'm going to lose this one here, that negative one is going to disappear. And I'm just going to redo my diagram so it, it sort of demonstrates what, what's going on here. Okay, but we've shifted that that bottom um, a set of cations and anions across that way. And now what you can see happening is that the negative and the negative are going to want to repel each other. The positive and the positive are going to want to repel each other. The negative and negative. So that's where we end up having this brittle property because they want to repel each other now that they're misaligned, if you like. Um, Another property of ionic compounds is that in their solid state, uh, they will not conduct electricity. Um, and that's because when, you, when you're conducting electricity, you need movement of charged particles. And when they're in a, in a solid state, they actually can't move anywhere. But if you can imagine that when we melt an ionic compound, if we heat it up very hot, okay, those uh, ionic um, the cations and anions are therefore then able to move around. And that's um, the reason why they can conduct electricity when they're in molten state. Um, they can also conduct electricity when they're in, um, in aqueous state. So in aqueous state, rather than being fixed in this lattice um, 
um, sort of this lattice setup where they can't move anywhere, when you dissolve them in water, what ends up happening is that the, the lattice actually breaks apart. And so what ends up happening is that you have your positive ions and your negative ions and they're apart, not only apart from each other, but they can move around in the water solution. And so the positive ions will be attracted to the negative terminal of the, of, uh, the, the electric uh, uh, setup, or the uh, negative, um, an, uh, sorry, the anions are attracted to the positive end of, of that setup. Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of an overview of how, how ionic compound, uh, ionic bonding works. I'm going to do one more. Um, so I'm going to look at covalent bonding. Now, covalent bonding um, is between, so I'm going to do um, covalent bonding it's between non-metals only. So all of the, um, the elements on the right hand side of the periodic table. Um, so uh, what ends up happening in covalent bonding, I like to think about, let's go back to ionic bonding. I like to think about ionic bonding where you have kind of like the stealing of electrons. You have or the donating of electrons to other atoms. So you've got your, your uh, metallic elements that donate their electrons to the um, non-metals and you end up with a cation and anion. In covalent bonding what ends up happening is to in order to um, fill that outer shell you actually have sharing of electrons. So um, in this scenario what have we got? If we've got, if we've got uh, two chlorine atoms um, I'm going to put red dots on one. Oh, green first, that works, fine, that's cool too. Okay, chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. And then on the other one, the other chlorine also has seven electrons in its outer shell. Neither of these, unlike ionic compounds, neither of these elements want to give away their electrons. So what they end up doing, rather than, um, rather than giving or taking electrons, is they end up sharing those electrons. And so what you end up with is what's called a covalent bond. And all a covalent bond is, is the sharing of electrons between two atoms. Okay, and so when we start talking about covalent ions, um, so if I sort of have a look at this, this is uh, the giving and taking of electrons. And then uh, non, uh, covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons. Okay, what you, what you start getting into after that when you're talking about covalent bonding is um, intramolecular bonding where you're talking about, uh, just, sorry, inter, intermolecular bonding. So you're talking about um, uh, dispersion forces, you're talking about uh, hydrogen bonding, you're talking about uh, dipole-dipole bonding, you're talking about iron dipole, which I'll, I'll cover in a different video if, if uh, people would like me to cover that. Um, but that's kind of a whole other um, discussion and it's probably going to take a bit longer than um, I'm trying to do my videos, less than 15 minutes, so they're a little bite size. Um, bite-sized videos for you guys to just take in some information, go away, have a think about it and come back later. Um, so hopefully this has been useful to you. Um, please, if you found this useful, please leave a like. Um, please leave a comment if you'd like me to cover the other types of bonding. That's usually quite a common thing, but um, please leave a comment or, or you can send me a private message if you prefer. Um, but if you found this useful, please give me some feedback. I'd really like to hear from you. I'd like you to hear that, yes, this is helping me. Yes, um, I'm, wow, that's so much clearer now. So uh, please do leave me some feedback. If you like what you're seeing, please like and share it. 
Um, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, it's just The Zen of Chemistry, or you could uh, sign up at my website. Um, I have some material that is not on Facebook, so if you uh, really like what I do, uh, I do release some of my lecture material um, on uh, through my mailing list. So if you're not on my mailing list, go and sign up now, it's at the top of this Facebook page, you can just click on the sign up button. Um, I hope this, you found this useful um, and thanks very much for joining me.